I never have understood, and no, in, in one way I do, I don't now understand. I never have understood Christians afraid of, worried about the judgment of God. Listen, God's judgment against your sins is accomplished. It took place 2,000 years ago. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, now is the judgment of this world. That wasn't me that said that, that's him that said that. Now is, now is the judgment of this world, now will the prince of this world be cast out. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. Boy, get that. When we were enemies, we were reconciled. Not when we were repentant at the front of the church, at the altar. And by the way, that's not really true. The front of the church is not an altar. Don't want to burst your bubble. This is, this is the front of the church. It's not an altar. We don't have an altar. Our altar is the cross. Altar is where a sacrifice takes place. No sacrifice is taking place up here. Listen, there's nothing, more, there's nothing holy about the front of the church. You know, I think people get this idea in their minds that in order to be right with God, two things got to happen. You got to come to the front of the church first. Number two, you got to cry. Crying at the front of the church does not make you right. It's the blood of Jesus that makes you right with God. Now, Alex is filming this. This is going to go on YouTube. I hope I'm not bursting anybody's bubbles. And I'm not against people coming to the front of the church. But you might as well, we could go to the back of the church. How about that? Let's all go to the back of the church and pray. <laughs> we can pray in your seats right now. Uh, what am I reading here? Oh, here it is. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled. That's the point. Get that. We, when we were enemies, we were reconciled. What reconciled us? The death of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. He did something that accomplished reconciliation. And before we ever knew anything about it, when we were still enemies, as far as God was concerned, he, we were reconciled by the death of his son. Much more, he says, not much less, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now that's really good. And it goes on, there's more good things, but I want to turn and read another passage. The point of this is that he says, uh, God wants to introduce us to his kind of love. That when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now that's the kind of love he had for us, that when, when we were sinners, he died for us. We think of that sometimes in a kind of a legalistic kind of a way, that as though uh, paying a parking penalty, or paying a parking ticket or doing some kind of legal thing. It was much more intimate than that, as I hope to prove to you in a minute. But let's read another one. Ephesians chapter 2. This is a good one. Also, he's talking about the love of God here. Verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you, meaning the reader, meaning the Christian who's reading this letter, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, actually, as you see... Uh, in the brackets there, you see the little brackets? What that is meaning, by putting brackets there on this thing on the screen, in the King James translation, which is a good honest translation, the words hath he quickened, which are in brackets here, are in italics in my Bible, in the King James translation. That means those words were added by the translators, hopefully to amplify or to express the meaning contained there. But if we take out those words, I think we can understand the thought maybe in this case more clearly. Take out those words, hath he quickened, because the translators added those. Read it this way. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's what he's talking about. He's talking to Christians, and he's calling to mind the fact that at one time we were alienated and separated from God. That's what he means by dead in trespasses and sins. And then he elaborates on that to, to give us the full import of what he means. Verse 2. Wherein, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Uh, that's talking about Satan, I believe. Uh, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Now, this is all really bad, what he's saying here. He says, but he says, in times past, we, meaning us, or you, uh, you walked according to the course of this world. That sounds bad. The prince of the power of the air. Now, that sounds even worse. The spirit that now is at work in the children of disobedience. That sounds terrible. Verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation, meaning manner of life. He says we all had our manner of life in times past. And just so you don't miss it, he's very specific. In the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Ooh, that sounds terrible. We kind of cringe as Christians to read that. 
and we're, listen to this, and we're by nature, by very nature, the children of wrath. Again, wrath means deserving God's punishment. We could say it this way. By very nature, we deserved God's punishment, even as others. Now listen to this. What we might expect to read, if, you know, if you've been in church very much, what you expect to read next is this. After reading about, you walked according to the course of this world, and the prince of the power of the air, and the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the mind, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. What you might expect to read next, and what you might actually hear in church is this. And God has had it up to here. And he is so mad. And God is fuming up in heaven right now. And he's angry. And he's looking down. And he is, going, he is about to judge America. And you and uh, everybody else. And mad and angry and uh, full of wrath and judgment. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard preaching that gave you that impression of God. But that's kind of what you might expect to read next after all this talk about sin and lust of the flesh and disobedience and wrath. But the great surprise here is right in the face of all of that description of being an enemy of God, being alienated from God, being dead, as he said, in trespasses and sins, the next thing we read is not that God's angry, not that he's had it up to here, but in verse 4 it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. How about that? In the very context of everything wrong, Paul says it this way to emphasize the fact that God loved us not because we were deserving of his love, not because we were going door to door and witnessing or handing out tracts or, you know, or uh, building a cathedral or, uh, you know, or sacrificing our lives, seeking for God. No, it says he loved us while we were sinners, as we read in Romans right in the face of all this description of everything wrong, it says, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, and just so you don't miss the point, I hate to, uh, you know, harp on little grammatical things. This verse, this little mark right here, you see that? That's not a period. That's a comma, right? And you know, Alex, you know what a comma, what, what does it mean when you see a comma, Alex? A pause. That means we're not stopping. We have more to say, right? The next verse is a continuation of what he's saying here. What's the next verse say? Even when we were dead in sins, and there's another comma, but let's just stop there and connect that with what we just read. But God, who is rich in mercy for the great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. How about that? God loved us even when we were dead in sins. Just stay with me now. Um, hath quickened us together with Christ. Now, quickened is an old English word meaning made alive. Hath made us alive together with Christ. Now, he says that when he says that he made us alive together with Christ, he's not talking to people in the cemetery. He's talking to people alive like us but he says when we were dead and by that he means in a state of sin dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ now when we know uh, we know that what he means um, about Christ being quickened or made alive when he was after three days in the tomb he was made alive isn't that right yeah now how did he get dead well, he died on the cross. And what was he doing on the cross? He was carrying our sins in his own body on the tree, according to 1 Peter 2.24. So in or order for us to be made alive together with Christ, let me flip that around and say he had to get dead together with us. Isn't that right? Just think about the, the wording here. He made us alive together with Christ. If together means that we're made alive together with him, then he had to get dead together with us. And not just physically dead, he had to enter into the same kind of death we were in. He, notice, again, I, I emphasized that a minute ago to say that he's not writing to people in the cemetery to say that he doesn't mean that kind of death. Christ became dead more than just physically dead. He became alienated from God just like we were. That's why on the cross he quoted the 22nd Psalm, which was appropriate at that moment, and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He entered into our alienated 
God-forsaken condition. He came into a union with us. Now, why did he do that? Because it was necessary in order to save us. 